and Jerry. They're here. Their cars oh, out there, so I they're uh, sitting up by the uh, community. Oh. oh, sorry. How sweet! Yeah. They're just sweethearts. Oh my. Uh-oh. Oh my. Uh-oh. There goes the hip. Yeah. <laughs> you know yeah, what well, he's, he's, He the... just reminds me of my husband. That's just the stuff my husband does. He climbs up still on the roof. <laughs> I said, don't you ever learn? <laughs> uh, no, Tell him he's too old to do that, but he doesn't think he is, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Good morning. I was Good checking morning. up on you. Oh, <laughs> me or her? Well, both of you. Yeah, both of you. <laughs> I said, where's Twyla and Jerry? And he said, they're here. He had to do it. Okay. I saw their yeah. car. Yeah. That's why they want you. Good morning. morning. How are you? Sure. Yeah. How are you? Yeah. Made a doctor's you appointment, so at least she's making some <laughs> progress. Oh, but I had to get her out. <laughs> yeah, at least she's trying to get to her help, which I was, didn't think she would. <laughs> I don't know what her problem is, but I she's going to the doctor. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Nice. Told her that she had a doctor's appointment, so. Oh, too much walking up and down. I was the surprised she would go. Well, we went to the basement to get the food. Ray, yeah. I don't know how he's doing yet. He's I guess there's no one here. So I'll, I'll, I'll go. take the seat beside her. Will you? We saved this one for you. Say that for me. <laughs> we did. Oh, I like it. Good morning. 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 No, no. It is pretty. Hi, Mary Lane. That's very pretty. It is. <laughs> Looks very spring. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> she wasn't you wishing that rich. snow away. Yeah. She, she looks like an Easter egg. I said, you're she wishing the snow right. away. <laughs> some, she said, we might get some more snow. I said, ah, I'm tired of snow. Well, they said, tomorrow night. Tomorrow. Yeah. Snow tomorrow. That's what they say. I hope it's up. Yeah, in I hope the snow area. area. <laughs> I'm thinking by the time we leave church today, we can, we won't need our coat. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'm hoping not. That's March. <laughs> yeah. One yeah. day and the next day. And I think next week they saw we'll need a winter coat. Yeah. 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 Down in the 30s. Well, I always now. figure anything that happens in March won't last long. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <That's true. laughs> Today's my daughter's birthday. My oh. Daughter's. Oh. Oh, you get to see her? No, no. <laughs> well, she's in Virginia. Oh. So not the one that had surgery. What? It's not the one that had no, surgery. No, no. And she's just fine. She's back to work. Is she really? In fact, she's got a bad cold now. Oh, no. <laughs> My daughter's oldest daughter's in March. She was, a uh, St. Patrick's Day baby. Oh, yeah, yeah. She's got a birthday coming, too. I was, I was really blessed. I, my daughter was Easter, Easter baby. Oh, oh Easter really? Baby. Mm -hmm. you Born say? on Easter Sunday, my oh, well. oldest. Sorry, so often. Her birthday. <laughs> my youngest was born on Palm Sunday. Wow. 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 March babies. Yeah. <laughs> my daughter has so many. She just has them by the month. <laughs> okay, all the March. Come now, all the April. <laughs> yeah. The kids don't like that. Girl. Morning, they want the attention. There she comes. Hello. How are you doing? Hello. How are you doing? Good, you're okay. Love your purple. <laughs> I love your purple. Oh, thank you. I know. I you love like your them. green. Okay. I only wore this. I only wore different. this because I could wear the earrings. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I look all spring too. Yeah, it's about time for spring. Yeah, yeah I'm ready. <laughs> Is that leg giving you a fit, Rita? Huh? Is your leg giving you a fit? Yes, yeah, sometimes. Just depends, huh? Yeah, when I'm up on it for a little while during the day, it's better. Okay, but are when I get, first get up, it. Are you getting stiff. anxious about the. A little bit. <laughs> I know it's going to be painful. Did they have you get that machine? I'm yes. not getting that. No. <laughs> it costs too much money. Oh, it costs too much money. Good morning to everyone. Are you going to get good morning, class. Oh, nice 
and good morning to those who are joining us online. We're glad to have you today. Uh, who's this lady in front of me here? I know her from somewhere. I just can't. Oh, there she is. I'm still. How are you today? I'm okay. <laughs> uh, well, so what a beautiful morning. Uh, sun. I don't know if any of you saw the sunrise this morning. Oh, oh gorgeous. It was beautiful. Breathtaking and um, beautiful, and it's nice to be alive. And you know, Christ is our Savior. I mean, can it get any better than that? I don't think so. Amen. Well, I was excited. I had a great uh, uh, time uh, this past week, uh, fellowshipping with the Lord and with His people, and uh, I had some good prayer uh, uh, request news. So that was always exciting. It's always nice to hear the Lord answer prayer. Amen. And uh, so we are excited about that and excited to share the day with you today as we uh, uh, seek to close out our long-standing principles of biblical understanding. And I wrote the different principles that we've gone through so far on the uh, uh, board behind me that you can look at for reference. And uh, we are currently in the Christocentric principle. And uh, this is, a, a, again, just refreshing our memory. The whole idea of this study is to say to us, if we want to uh, study the Bible, and we want to make sure that what we glean from the Bible is what God intended, then there are principles that we submit ourselves to and say, I'm not going to be, I'm going to try as best as I can not to be influenced by my grandmother or my mom or my dad or by my denomination, or by my upbringing, but I want to be central focused on what it is that God intended. So I was raised up in a Baptist church nine months before I even breath, breathed my first breath of oxygen, amen. Um, and uh, I learned a, a lot of different things uh, through the church that I grew up in, but I, I didn't want to, when people say, well, what religion are you? I didn't want to say Baptist, because Baptist isn't a religion, it's a denomination. And I didn't want to say Baptist, because there's like Heinz variety, there's a ton of them. So still someone doesn't know what you believe, and they probably wouldn't. So I've always wanted to say to people when they say, what religion are you? I said, well, I'm not religious. And then I define it. Religion is man trying to earn God's favor. And I, I'm not trying to earn God's favor because it could never do it. So I'm not religious. And you can see them, they'll go, <laughs> like, you know, they're like, they don't know what to say. And they'll say, well, what are you? And I'll say, I'm a Bible believer. I believe the Bible. And they go, oh, like that's some sort of cult <laughs> or something, you know. And, and But it opens the door, they'll say, well, what do you believe? And then I'll say, I believe that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. There's no other way to heaven through him. He's the one that provided access for me to get to heaven, and I get to heaven through his merits and his works, not my own. What kind of works? Well, he died on the cross, and he offered himself a substitute for me so that I don't have to do that. And so all this is, uh, you know, this uh, it's a combination of all these things with an intent well good morning with an intent uh to uh specifically pin pigeonhole you to answer a question to their understanding and i don't want to do that so uh when someone comes up to me and they go what religion are you i say i'm not religious and after they like start disbelief i say i define it religion is about someone trying to earn their way into God's favor and I can't do that and then they'll come back and they'll say well what are you and I'll say uh, um, I am a Bible believer and then they say well, what's that belief and then I'm able to tell them not I'm Baptist or I'm Prince, uh, Pentecostal or I'm Church of Christ or I'm, all these things that confuse everybody all right, and so rather than de identify myself by some denominational name or some tag that someone wants to be able to say, oh, that's what you are, okay, I say I'm a Bible believer. 
Well, then that takes us to another level, not to the person that I'm talking to, but to our own minds. What is a Bible believer? Okay, and a Bible believer is someone that believes what the Bible says, as opposed to what standard teaching from someone else might mean. All right. So, like I said, I grew up in a Baptist church. I was born uh, uh, before I was born. I was in a Baptist church, and uh, that's pretty much all that I have had in my background is a Baptist. But I, but I realized that there are a slew of different Baptists, and so I didn't. I don't want to identify as, oh, I'm this kind, because they would think that you believe what they believe. I always want people to know that I believe the Bible. That's the only thing. There isn't anything outside of that to believe but the Bible. You say, okay, well, how do you know what you believe the Bible to say to be what the Bible actually says? And that's the reason we've had this long, over two-year course on principles of biblical understanding and in that we've gone down through these principles and we say all right as a bible believer i submit myself to these principles i don't go off wheelie nearly i don't come up with some thing that i really think is great and grand and or someone that i heard that said that started talking about this and i thought man that's a really great idea i think that'll be my idea too okay all these things happen you know and so all i do is i say okay Here's the principles when I study the Bible to ascertain what God's intent was. Because the intent of the author is what we really want. Not the intent of those who read the author. Do you hear me, what I said? I don't want to hear what someone thought that person meant. I want to know what that person meant. What was the intent of the author? And in order to get the intent of the author... I use these principles. Now, there are probably a few more principles because we talked there's maybe 20 or 21 principles, and uh, uh, but some of them tend to overlap and, and kind of uh, squish together. So, but these are these are bold, definite principles. And when I read the Bible and I want to ascertain what it is that God wants me to understand, the intentional intent of the author. Now, I'm not talking about Paul or Peter, or Matthew, or John. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. He's the author. All right. So I want to know what the intent of the author is. And in doing that, I run it through this uh, here. And just briefly stated, ethnic, there are three groups of people mentioned in the Bible. Jews, Gentiles, and Church of God. Those are the only three. If you are not Gentile, you're Jew. If you're not Jew, you're Gentile. And the only way you can either be not a Jew or a Gentile, the only way you get out of those two things is to become a Christian, and then you're neither Jew nor Gentile, you're church. Those are the only three ethnic groups uh, in the Bible. And when we write a letter, we write a letter saying to so-and-so. We write what we want to get across, and then we sign our name at the bottom, right? So, Jerry, you wouldn't pick up a letter that was sent to my house and go down through there and read that and say, I can't believe that they don't like my blonde hair. <laughs> All right? Because you would know that that letter said, Dear John, oh, I've gotten so many of those, uh, uh, <laughs> that, it, that it said, Dear John, right? And so you would understand that before you started digesting all the body of that letter, you would want to know who it's to. And though all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable, all right, not all of it was written directly to me. So there's the ethnic principle. That means that when I look at the Bible, I ask, who's this written to? Does it say? And we looked at the difference between 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and James chapter 1. James chapter 1, verse 1 says, to the 12 tribes scattered abroad, greeting. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, it says, to the saints of God, in Corinth. So that, that if there's a two who it's written to everywhere. So we have the ethnic principle. And then the context principle. If you want to believe uh, that um, your church is the church, then you, you go into Matthew where Jesus is talking to Peter and you just pull that one verse out that says, upon this, upon this rock I'll build my church 
and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And all of a sudden, you can start a whole belief system that your church is the only church based on one verse pulled in completely out of Scripture, out of context. And, uh, and that's what a lot of false beliefs are based on, Scriptures that are taken out of context. If I wanted to say that the only way you can get to heaven and be a part of the true church is to be baptized, I would reach over there in Acts chapter 2, verse 38. I'd pull that verse clear out of the context, and I would say just what Acts 2, verse 38 says. All right? Is it repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And I would pull that verse clear out of the context, and I develop an entire belief system around that verse that has nothing to do with the context. So if you look at Acts chapter 2 on your own, and you consider these two together, when you read down through Acts chapter 2, there is not one mention anywhere of church or unsaved people. It is emphatic throughout the whole chapter, ye men of Israel, ye Jews, all the way down, when we look at the ethnic principle, it's a passage written to Jewish people. So, again, combining these two helps us to see, first of all, who's it written to? Secondly, what's the context say? Don't just pull something out, you know, two words out of the middle of the verse and say, ah, oh, last I found it, you know. You want to look at how it's written and pick all the verses before, all the verses afterwards, all the books before, all the books and chapters after is the context of where it was set. And then the application. There are these wonderful, beautiful applications. And the difference between an application and a type is the Bible calls itself a type. But the, the principles are the same. It's a picture of something yet to happen. So the, uh, uh, the Lord Jesus used these applications and pictures all the time. We call them what? parables. All right. If you can understand this, then you can understand this spiritual principle. And so he said, a sower went to sow seed in the ground. And the disciples said, okay, tell us what that means. He said, the sower is the word of God. Okay. So, so you see all these pictures that are through the Bible, we want to take in consideration these. So I might not understand Numbers chapter 24 when I read through there where the serpents were biting all the nation of Israel and Moses said, okay, God, what am I supposed to do? Everybody's dying. And he said, go get a pole. Fashion the serpent, the sin, the destroyer. Fashion it on a pole and lift the pole high in the air. And then tell all the nation of Israel when they get bit by that deadly serpent to look to the pole and they'll live. I might not understand that except for when I get to the New Testament and Jesus said, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so shall the Son of Man be lifted up. Now all of a sudden, not only do I see that those are this is a picture of this, but I can start making some, okay, well, why did he say, why didn't he put a giraffe on the top of that pole? Why didn't he put a fox? Why didn't he put... <laughs> Siri wants to answer us. Uh, I, why, why didn't he tell to put a, um, a a tree on top of that? All right, because Jesus became sin for us who knew no sin, and the serpent on the pole became that which was biting the people. So these pictures, these similarities, become so wonderful. And did they have to climb up the pole and touch the snake? Did they have to come over? And bow down a hundred times in front of the pole, what did the Bible say they had to do to get looked and live? <laughs> okay, so so there, there's so many wonderful things when we start examining the types or the applications in the Bible that give us understanding of what the intent of the author, God, intended. And then we have this discrimination principle, which is the opposite of our woke uh, world today. We think of discrimination, you immediately think of racism. But that, that's not what this is. A, is, a, is there are differences. And discriminating means don't make everything the same. Look at what is different and identify what is different and what are the same. All right? And so discrimination says just because the word kingdom is in the Bible doesn't mean that every kingdom is the same kingdom. So there are differences. So you have the kingdom of heaven. 
and you have the kingdom of God, and because they both have kingdom in front of them, people make the false assumption that they're one and the same. But discrimination says, better look at that out, look that thing out. Luke 17, verse 21, or 17, 20, Luke 21, verse 17, I don't know, it's one of the two. Uh, it says, when they were demanded of the Pharisees what the kingdom of God, Jesus is the one that answered, you don't say low here or low there, for behold, the kingdom of God is within you. So kingdom of God is a spiritual kingdom within the uh, saved person. The kingdom of heaven is a literal, visible because right after Jesus rose from the dead, right after he committed these great joys and miracles of dying, giving his life, and raising from the dead, the Jews asked him in Acts chapter 1, verse 6, will you at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? They weren't interested in the spiritual kingdom. They wanted a prophet like unto Moses that was going to bring them a literal kingdom. And so knowing the differences between, that the Bible makes that are differences, are very, very important, and we need to understand those differences, and in studying those differences, we will learn more about the intent of the author. And then the numeric, that was kind of fun, I don't know if you remember that, but uh, numerics, it's amazing how God put this Bible together, and not just the translation that we have, uh, but, but the Bible itself, that numbers throughout the Bible have significance. And so when you think of uh, one, or you think of three, or you think of seven, or you think of five, or you think of twelve, or you think of ten. I know I'm counting backwards. But uh, when you think of those numbers, they all have significance. All right, number one is that's singular. There's no one but one God. Okay. When you think of three, it's one God with three different personages, three different works, three different manifestations God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. You think of five. You think of both death and grace, and it's not a far-fetched thought, death and grace, because D-E-A-T-H and G-R-A-C-E, they both have five letters, but Jesus, J-E-S-U-S, he is the one that died on the cross for us, and his death brought us grace. So death and grace, and when you see that, the first mention principle, which is the next one, is where's the first time you find grace in the Bible? It is Noah, and Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Uh, there is this, and again, it's real easy to get indoctrinated by what you've been taught that might not be 100% correct, okay? So I always believed growing up that Noah was the guy that God said, among all this wickedness out here, let me find somebody that's not, oh, there's someone that's not wicked, Noah. But that's not the Bible. Grace doesn't look for people that are better than others. All right? Where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Okay? And so, to think that Noah somehow or another got chosen by God because he was better than the other people there is not biblically supported. Noah, in fact, what does grace do? Grace seems to choose the ones that are the worst. And Noah uh, was picked by God to show a trophy of his grace that Noah did not deserve an ark for the saving of his soul, but God gave it to him in fact because he didn't deserve it. And Noah didn't have to do anything to get in the ark. He built the ark. But the ark would have never saved him if there wasn't a door. Jesus said, I am the door. <laughs> okay, so you, so all these things, uh, so you have the first mention principle, and oh, that's such a fascinating uh, study in the Bible when you look at the first time a word phrase person or situation occurs in the Bible and it kind of sets the tone for what it's going to be like all the way through the whole Bible it's a beautiful beautiful picture and then we talked about the progressive mention principle which takes the first mention principle and goes through the Bible exhaustively to see if the supposition that you made at the first mention principle is true again this is not the whole idea is this is a layer upon layer of making sure that we apply these principles so that we do not get left or right of center. Center being God's will. And then the full mention principle is after we find the first mention principle in the Bible, we follow it all the way through the Bible to make sure that it is what we assumed to be correct. Then we say, is there any place in the Bible that takes all of that and mentions it in one place? And so we talked about uh, resurrection 
or the concept of resurrection, where does it begin? And we found of all places, it's not with the word resurrection, but with the event. And that was way back in Genesis chapter 1, when God said, I want the dry land to bring forth. There was resurrection. And then we made some uh, a, a summary statement based upon that, and based upon the scripture that was before us. And then we ran all the way through the Bible on that subject matter, and found out that the Bible confirmed what we made as the summary statement and added some things to it as we moved along because we got more information. And then lo and behold, we went to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We found every one of those principles, including the seed and the ground, all mentioned in one place in the Bible. So again, this is this check and balance system to make sure that what we're coming up with is not just our traditions, not just our moms, grandmas, and uh, people that we fell in love with growing up, but that it isn't indeed what God intended. And so we have the full mention. And then the last one that we're, we are considering and uh, uh, we uh, look at is the Christocentric principle. And uh, this is an exciting principle where to understand uh, the Bible, look for Jesus. All right, To understand the Bible, look for Jesus. The centrality of our study of God's Word is with this lens of always trying to see Jesus. If you can try to find Jesus, all of a sudden it's amazing. He's everywhere in the Old Testament and the New Testament. And not that we're looking with this, I know Jesus, so I'm trying to find him. Like, where's Waldo? You remember that? Okay, that's not that. All right. This is, I'm looking at the Bible with no thought in my mind. And Jesus appears everywhere. So it's not going to the Bible with this, okay, this is what I believe. Let me see if I can find Waldo. Okay, I don't mean any disrespect by that. But it is saying, let me look at the scriptures and see what they say. And amazingly, guess who I find is the center of everything? It's Jesus. So we uh, looked at the mind of deity is eternally centered in Christ. And we went down through that. Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. Uh, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 8. John chapter 14, verse 9. Uh, Colossians 1, 16. So, I mean, we just, we hit a home run, man. It was wonderful to see that the mind of God is seen through Jesus Christ. So when in Philippians chapter 2, verse, uh, at verse number 5, he said, let this mind be in you, who is also in Christ Jesus, which is also in Christ Jesus, he's saying that if you want to understand deity, then you understand Jesus. In fact, he went on to say in Colossians chapter 1 that uh, in him, Jesus, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So if you want to understand the Bible, you look for Jesus. Because he's everywhere. And we went all the way through that. Not only is Jesus the form of God, the mind of God, the image of God, the creator of the universe, he is the essence <laughs> of deity. You want to understand the Bible from the concept or theology of God, you look for Jesus. Okay? And uh, because he's the image of the invisible. That's how we understand him is through Jesus. All right. And then all angelic thought and ministry are centered in Jesus Christ. And we used as our uh, starting place Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1 through 7. And this is where um, King Uzziah is writing. He said in the, in the uh, uh, Isaiah's writing about King Uzziah, he said, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. And he literally saw the Lord. And then he talks about what he saw in that vision Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 7. He, he talked about that, what he saw. And it was, it was amazing uh, when we considered that. Uh, and it talked about his uh, train filled the temple. And it talked about the seraphim, the angelic beings, one of the three, angels, seraphims, and cherubim. All three of them are the angelic beings spoken of in the Bible. And Isaiah wrote about this vision that he had. And when he saw the vision, he felt undone. 
because he saw the judgment of God against King Uzziah. And he, he made the declaration, I'm a man of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. Woe is me, for I'm undone. And all of that in its glory. And we ran over, after we looked at that, at John chapter 12, verses 36 through 42. And who, who ascribes, is ascribed to be the one that was there in his vision? It is Jesus. Jesus. So when Isaiah said, I, the, my eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts, when he said, uh, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord and his glory filled the, or his train filled the temple. Who was he seeing? It was Jesus, according to uh, John chapter 12, verse 36 through 42. And so the glory the seraphim saw was Jesus. And then we looked all the way through Revelation. It's just repeatedly we see that Jesus Christ is the image of the glory of God. All right? And it just reaffirms uh, all that we said. So all angelic thought, all angelic uh, message was centered on Jesus Christ. In fact, one that we are really familiar with is uh, with uh, Mary, and uh, first to her husband and then to Mary, uh, Gabriel shows himself, and he says, Thou art highly favored among women, and uh, the holy uh, thing shall overshadow thee, and you're going to give birth to a baby, and you shall call his name and who, what, what specific name? God. Jesus. All right. So when you look at that, you think, so all angelic thought and messages are centered on Jesus Christ. Even though we look in the Old Testament, a lot of times we say, oh, this is talking about God. Well, I, I mean, yes, but who is God? Jesus is God. And again, the visible image of God is always Jesus, all right? And so all angelic announcements, all angelic messages, all angelic thought is subject to uh, and spoken of is Jesus. Uh, the angels are subject to Jesus in 1 Peter 3.22. Uh, when Jesus returns the second time, uh, angels will accompany him, uh, Matthew 25. Remember when Jesus was tempted in the wilderness, who was it that came and sustained him afterwards? It was angel, angels. That all angelic thought and ministry is centered on the person of Jesus Christ. Angels worship Jesus in Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 6. And so uh, angels are either preparing God's people to accept Jesus, his kingdom, or announce his birth. They are all about Jesus. And then we looked at all satanic hatred and subtlety. Subtlety are centered at Christ. <clears throat> all of the hatred of Satan, all of his lying and deception is all centered on Jesus Christ. His only interest in you and me is because we have Jesus in us. All right, what did Jesus say to Peter? Satan hath desired to sift you as wheat, but I prayed for you. Why did he do that? Why did he want to sift him as wheat? Because of Peter? Well, he didn't try to sift him as wheat before he came to be a disciple. It was only afterwards. So it's not us that he is after. It is after the one who is in us. All right? And so all satanic hatred and subtlety are centered at Christ. Isaiah 14, uh, verses 13 through 14 uh, whenever that time was that, that the prophet Isaiah spoke and penned those words, uh, it was about um, uh, the beginning of this hatred, hostility, and subtlety from Satan. And it went all the way back to Genesis when he made his first appeal to the wife of Adam and said, Yea, have God said, It is always an attack upon his word, God's word, and always to get at God, not you and I. Satan didn't care anything about Eve. Did, did he come alongside and warm her hands after she was expelled from the garden? Come alongside and hold her in her consolation? No. 
The only interest he has in you and me is who we have in us. No other interest at all. And what did Jesus tell us? The thief cometh not but for to kill, steal, and destroy. <laughs> Satan. All of it centered on Jesus Christ. His subtlety began sometime in the time before Adam and Eve when he was the anointed cherub that covered the throne and decided that he was going to exalt himself above the stars of God and be like the Most High. And whatever time period that took place, he lost that position as the anointed cherub that covers. Never find it anywhere else in the Bible. You can talk about cherubim, but not the anointed cherub that covers. He was kicked out of heaven. Angels joined with him in his rebellion. And Satan then met at the apex of this great and glorious creation of humankind and said, I hate God, and I'll destroy what he created. And he chose Eve. And Eve fell, and the perfect picture of the plan of God, Adam did not have to eat the fruit, and he was not deceived. He ate it because he loved Eve. God so loved the world, the second Adam, that he gave his only begotten son. So the beautiful picture in all of the, even the subtlety and hatred of Satan works into the plan of God to show the eternal purpose of God, and that is to save us from our sin. <clears throat> so <clears throat> from that in Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, to Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, when the event had already occurred and the judgment of God is pronounced, one of the primary judgments of the curse of Eve eating the fruit was God said, I'm going to put enmity between thee and the serpent, between his seed, so Satan has a seed, and her seed. Women don't have seed. So that prophecy was about the prophetic virgin birth. It had to be a miracle because women don't have seed. Between his seed and her seed. And that prophecy told us that God was going to provide a seed that was going to ultimately produce a seed from a woman that was going to destroy the evil one, Satan. And so we follow this seed all the way down through the Bible. And guess what we discover every time the seed's there? Satan's there trying to destroy the seed. God shuts up Sarah's womb in desperation finally. Even after Genesis 12, get thee away from thy family and thy kindred into a place that I'll show thee of. Abraham. Years go by, no kid, no kid. Look in the sky. All the stars are up. That's how many kids I'm going to give you. 90 years old, no children. Sarah finally decided to take things on herself. Do you think she did it by herself? What is interesting about Eve in the garden and Sarah? <laughs> Isn't that just take Hagar and have children with her? And God said, that will not be the seed. And at 99 years of age, past the time of childbearing, Sarah has a child. And his name is Isaac. And God said, this is the seed. And those two seeds have fought one another over the uh, decades and the millenniums. And they will never stop until God plants his throne on this earth as the king of the nation of Israel. Uh, forever. Satan's always been after that seed. Even if we walk fast forward to... Golgotha's hill. I finally got him. He's nailed to the cross. He's bleeding to death. They take him off the cross. They place him in the tomb. Satan inspires those who are in authority to put cards at the tomb. We're just getting ready to celebrate this. Amen. 
and the guards fell asleep, and the roll the stone rolled back, and he that was dead came forth. That's always after the sea. Satan's subtlety and uh, deceptions and his hatred is always after Jesus. And we could go on. And I said last week, or the week before, <laughs> uh, it's hard not to go on. Because it's so exciting to see when we talk about the principles of biblical understanding, once our eyes are open to see the truth, what did you say on the way in today about the sea? I've seen it everywhere. It, it starts popping up everywhere. It's no longer that we're living in darkness. Now our eyes have been opened. Not by our denomination. Not by our grandmas or grandpas. Not by those well-intended people that try to instruct us. But by the Holy Spirit that lives inside of us. That Christ said, when he comes, he will guide you into all truth. He's the instructor. He's the one that teaches us. Someone might open our eyes to it. But then all of a sudden from there, the Holy Spirit takes us. And every time we open it up, we go, oh, there it is again. Oh, 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 oh. And, and the confirmation is so exciting. What does it provoke us to do? To read more. To read more, yeah. I mean, and that is the joy of it. The joy of it is when you're provoked by the Holy Spirit to do what God intended for us to do. Then you don't need a teacher. You, I mean, all of a sudden you are loosed from the shackles of private interpretation and open to the principles of biblical understanding so you can know what the intent of the author is. And after all, that's what it is. As a pastor and a teacher, I never, any more than I do as a parent, ever want someone to be dependent on me for the rest of their life. What kind of a person would do that? I don't want my kids at 40 years of age to still be living in my house requiring me to bring a paycheck home so that I can feed them. The purpose of being a good parent and a good teacher or pastor is that you give people the truth that they embrace. Not all of them will, but they embrace. And then they become a spiritual leader in their own realm. That's how the church has propagated itself over the centuries forever. And that's the reason Paul said to Timothy, training faithful men to do so. That's God's plan. This idea of of a local church to see how large we can get it. No, a local church is supposed to be a sending unit. It's supposed to train them, build them up, and send Jane Russells out. That now not Jane Russell, right? <laughs> uh, but but to send, that's what the church is supposed to do. This is not to be mega, so that we can say we're bigger than you are. Ha, 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 ha. But that's what the modern American church has become. And instead of propagating the truth and teaching and training so that we can send them out. Instead, we've brought in entertainers to entertain us. And we go, boy, didn't we have a great time at church today? Where in the world do you find that in the Bible? It's not in there. What's in the Bible is to train people, send them out to do the work of Christ because he's coming back. And if we don't get done, then it's going to be curtains. The door of the ark is going to close. And the people will cr scratch and crawl to get in, but it's too late. Paul said to the Thessalonians, For this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth. That's not a curse word. It's saying that they will die without hope and without God. And that's the reason that the uh, uh, Bible says, that Paul says, we have this treasure in an earthen vessel. We're to be... Uh, uh, ambassadors for Jesus Christ to take the word of Christ out to give hope to the world around us. But instead we become a club. Talking about what a great time we had. And I'm not wrong with having a good time with Christian folks. But that's not what the church is primarily supposed to be. That's a byproduct. The church primarily is supposed to be is to train in the word of God so that you no longer need the trainer. Didn't Silas go his way? Didn't Barnabas go his way? Didn't all of them go their own way? Didn't Timothy go his own way? If Epaphroditus, didn't he go his own? They all went their own way. That's the biblical model. You can do so much more with multiple people than you can with one. Unless their ego is really big, and then you can't do without the one, right? Or that person can't do without the one. That's not the way the church is supposed to be. So biblical understanding, we look at these and we say, okay, what's the center? The center here is Christ. Not only is Christ the center 
of all deity. Not only is Christ the center of all angelic being, not only is Christ the center of all that there is, but Christ is center of the scriptures. When you look at the Bible, he claims to be the center of it all. It's kind of interesting. Let's look at the Bible for a few minutes. Nice to have a Bible study and not use the Bible. I've quoted it a lot. I hope that you uh, enjoyed the quoting. Uh, Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24. And look at verse 27. We'll start at um, verse 22. Now, if you know the scene of Luke chapter 24, it's the two on the road to Emmaus. They've just left Jerusalem. They're on their way back to their home, Emmaus. And they're disappointed because Jesus was crucified. And he rose from the dead, but nobody's seen him yet. Except for a couple people said they saw him. Look at verse 21. But we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. And besides this, today is the third day since these things were done. Yea, and certain women also of our company made an astonished, which were early at the sepulcher. And when they found not his body, they came, saying that they had also seen a vision of angels, there it is again, which had said he was alive. And certain of them which were with us went to the sepulcher and found it even as the women had said, but him, Jesus, they saw not. Then he said unto them, Who is the he? It's Jesus. All right. They didn't know that then, but later they did. And and when they realized it was him, what did they say? Did not our hearts burn within us? <laughs> okay. I mean, there's something about that guy. But look what he does. He says, O oh, you, O oh, fools, and slow to heart to believe all that the what? have spoken ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory now look where he goes to explain everything that just happened to him and beginning at Moses and all the prophets he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning who himself, himself. <laughs> okay so all the Old Testament, beginning with Moses, he said, go all the way back there. They're all talking about me. But all scripture is centered around Jesus Christ. It's there. It's so pronounced uh, in that. I didn't upset Janet. She's no. greater than me. <laughs> yeah. so, amen. So, so it's, it's all central to him. Look at John chapter 5, and look at verse 39. John chapter 5, and verse 39. <clears throat> Again, all the scriptures are centered on Jesus Christ. John chapter 5, verse 39. Jesus is speaking, and he says this bold statement, Search the scriptures. Well, why in the world would he tell us to search the scriptures? Follow the verse. For in them you think that you have eternal life. Now notice the next phrase. For they are they which testify of me. It's all about him. That all the scriptures are about him. Look at Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. Now I, I'm giving you all these references. And I don't want you to stumble at them. But I'm doing it. I mean, there's only one John 3.16. We believe that wholeheartedly. Right? So when you see the same thing four or five times, you should believe it four or five times more hardly, right? <laughs> okay? I mean, just logic tells us that. Uh, uh, <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 10, and look at verse number 7. Uh, this is a quote from the Old Testament, and Paul is using it to, to teach to the Hebrews here <clears throat> that in the Old Testament, those references were about Jesus. And notice what he says in verse number 7. Then said I, lo, I come in the volume of the book. What's that? Scriptures. It is written of me to do thy will, O God. Now, 
who is Paul talking about? Look at verse 10. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. So he's talking about Jesus, and he says, in the Old Testament, when it says, Lo, I come in the volume of the book it is written to me to do thy will, O God, it was Jesus that said that. Yeah. All centered on him. Look at Matthew chapter 5. We're running out of time, so we'll have to stop it. We'll do three more. Look at Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 17. Matthew chapter 5, verse 17. Jesus was being questioned. Not honestly, sarcastically. Questioned about um, the scriptures. And look what he says in chapter 5, verse 17. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. So there's Moses and there's the prophets. That's the Old Testament. I am not come to destroy, but to what? He's saying, I'm it. I'm, everything back there in the Law and the Prophets is about me, and I came to fulfill everything that was spoken of about me. Look at Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24. We just looked at this, but I want to do it again. Just for emphasis. Luke 24. We're going to look at a different place. Verse 44. And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets, and he adds another one, and in the Psalms concerning me. <laughs> he said, I'm it. I, everything there is about me. One last one and then we have to go. The preacher gets real upset if I go over time. Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10. And look at verse 43. Acts chapter 10 and verse 43. Acts chapter 10 verse 43. To him Give all the prophets witness, they testify, that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remissions, remission of sins. To him give all the prophets witness. Meaning, all the prophets are testifying of who? Jesus. Okay. Now, um, we're going to move on from there next week, Lord willing. Um, and we'll move to maybe the conclusion, but I'm not in a hurry. I like to just, and I love to just look in the scriptures and hear the pages of the Bible turn. Isn't that exciting? Um, but if we're going to understand the Bible of what the intent of the author is, one of the principles is, is always look for Jesus. Because Jesus said, all of that back there is about me. It's all about me back there. It's about my work, what I intended to do. And that's the reason he kept saying, fulfilled in me, fulfilled in me. Everything back there was prophesying about me, and I came to fulfill it. So if we're going to understand the Bible, we're going to look for Jesus, Christ of century, um, as our, in our study. All right, and we'll stop there and pick it up next week. So good to have Frank and Mark with us, and George and Phyllis. And... <laughs> I teased my mom about that. And just almost painfully, didn't it? Me and Rita. <laughs> <laughs> Coffee with Rita and you and Mark. Yeah. So, so, but it's so good to have you guys with us today, and the rest of you as well. May God bless you as we uh, digest some of the things that we heard. And uh, as we prepare for the service this year ahead, let's stop and have a word of prayer. Father, thank you so much for this time, and uh, indeed the truth of your word, and uh, the simplicity that brings to us the opportunity to be able to express it, and I pray, Father, that you continue to bless us as we look into it. We have the service to follow, and help us, Lord. Uh, don't know for sure if there'll be someone here this morning that might not know you as their Savior. Help us to be clear and open about how one comes to know Christ as their Savior. Maybe some that come really heavy 
a lot of difficulties in their life. Might be health, money, or could be relationships. And they come with a heavy heart. God, I pray that you give us the tenderness of a nurse uh, to come and bring a consolation that Christ is a conqueror and he can win those battles. And then I pray, Father, that you bless with those who are charged and ready. And I pray, Father, that the word of God might come across magnificently today in a way that would inspire us and provoke us to love our God and to live for him in a way that would be better than last week. We'll give you the praise for all that you do. We pray it with our hearts and with our minds in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks so much. God bless.